All right. Good morning, everyone. Well, here we are, Sunday morning, and what I thought we'd do is just get our attention on what we're here for. So I'd like to start out this morning with prayer. So if you bow your heads, let's, let's pray. God, we are looking forward to spending some time with you this morning as a group, as a church body. We pray, Lord, that you'd come and, and soften our hearts, help us to prepare to receive what it is you want to teach us this morning. And God, I pray that we would open our hearts and minds to you even in worship, that, Lord, we would just look at this time as an opportunity to connect with you. God, help us to do that as Janet takes us into a time of worship. Lord, help us to give you praise honestly. God, if there's things on our hearts where we're frustrated, Lord, help us to share that inside with you. Help us to have a conversation with you this morning as we worship. And I pray that that worship would continue past our singing into our time of learning this morning and into our day and into the week. God, help us to carry this attitude of worship. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd stand now and worship together, that'd be great.
may be seated. Thank you, Janet. So this morning we're going to continue our time of worship by giving you and I an opportunity to share some prayer requests and some praise reports. So looks like Charlotte's got the mic and she will pass it around to anyone who may have a prayer concern or a praise report. Um, last Sunday, we sent the prayer chain for Loretta Broker's uh, brother, Phil, and she um, posted this morning on Facebook that he passed away yesterday, so I think we need to keep Loretta Broker and all of her family in our prayers. Thank you. Uh, Keith was diagnosed on Thursday with bladder cancer. And he's going to be having surgery on the 19th of February. So just pray for him and pray for us. Thank you. and also less. Yeah, Arthur, do you, do you have an update on uh, less? No. Well, I'm going to have a praise. We've had these concerns. We uh, watched our church service last Sunday in North Carolina come through loud and clear on his big television. Nice. So real good. So we appreciate that. And we had good traveling both ways. Two drivers, Randy and Beth. So Janet and I just sat there and rode along. <laughs> That's the way to go, man. What? Yeah. And Deb. And Deb, yeah. Sure. And Deb's highlight of the whole time was eating in a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming a highlight these days. <laughs> Thanks, Arthur. I want to thank everyone for their prayers. Les is doing well. And this time he's keeping his foot up and he is behaving. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. All right. One more to add to the list here. Uh, so the, the gentleman, Austin, who's been doing our website, his mother-in-law recently unexpectedly passed away. So if we could keep Austin and his wife, Brittany, in our prayers this week, uh, that would be wonderful too. So Austin and Brittany. And I will take us to the Lord now in prayer. And then uh, from there, uh, I'm going to lead us right into the Lord's prayer right after that. So if you would join me in prayer, we'll pray about these things, and then we'll move right into the Lord's prayer. After that, Lord, we just come to you right now. A lot of praises, a lot of concerns out in the world, God, and you know the prayer reports and the concerns that we have here as a church family. Lord, you know about Loretta Broker and the family and the pain and, and what they need, God, right now, the comfort that they need, the peace that they need. We pray, God, that they would just receive from you. And Lord, we pray that grace would shine down on Keith, on our Keith this morning. God, we pray that this bladder cancer can be removed and that he can uh, be cancer-free and that, Lord, that uh, you would just bless him in whatever is involved with that surgery on the 19th. And, Lord, we are thankful for Kay's report on Les. We pray he does continue to behave himself. Lord, and that he uh, keeps his leg up and heals properly. We just ask that you would be with him. We pray you'd be with Val, God. Um, we ask, Lord, that you'd be with Austin and Brittany and uh, Brittany's brother, Tyler. God, we pray for that family. 
pray for comfort. We pray for peace as well. We ask, God, that you would just show yourself in very unique ways in the coming weeks and months as, as Brittany and Tyler especially uh, heal from the loss of their mom. We pray, God, that uh, this live streaming that we are partaking in, Lord, continues to reach people. That, God, you do what you want with these messages, with our time together and it being aired out on the internet. Lord, we just praise you for that and we thank you for technology and how it can be used in very good ways. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And if you would, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever. Amen. Thank you. Oh, we have, no, okay. We're good? Okay. Uh, all right, well, welcome, you guys. Um, just want to close our series out now on Colossians. So for those of you who've been following along, you know we've been working our way through the letter of Colossians. And today we conclude our study of Colossians written by the Apostle Paul. I'm going to give a brief recap. Paul wrote this letter for two primary reasons. The first, he wanted to push back, as you may recall, on this Gnostic teaching that was beginning to circulate in the first century, which would later be identified as Gnosticism. So when Paul wrote this letter, Gnosticism was not fully developed. Nevertheless, there was this certain teaching that was uh, basically circulating, like I said, in the church. They were taking bits and pieces from the Jewish faith, from non uh, Judeo-Christian thinking, as well as teaching from Plato, which basically said the physical world is bad, the spiritual world is all good. And this mixed bag of teaching and philosophy, like I said, was creeping into the church. So this teaching Paul addressed was the beginnings of what would later be established Gnosticism in the second century. And since Gnostic thinkers saw for the most part the physical world is all bad, they abstained as we talked about, remember? Um, or at least limited themselves from physical pleasure. Limiting the amount of you know, food and drink they would have, the amount of sleep they would have, abstaining from sex, they saw all of this as bad. And also Gnostics believed that there is this special mystical knowledge that was needed to ask, that one needed to ascertain. You needed to gain this knowledge in order to save your soul from this evil fleshly body and material world once you died. You need to have that knowledge ahead of time. And so in our study through Colossians, we have seen how Paul has pushed back on the physical world being bad. We see here in Colossians, here's an example of where he pushed back Colossians 1, 5. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you. He's talking about that, hey, I am giving thanks for you guys, he says in Colossians 1. So the context here, he's saying, we always thank God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ because of the faith that you have. And he says in verse 5, the faith and the love that spring up from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You notice here how Paul is saying this message, this Christian good news, this gospel is for everyone. And it's spreading all over. This is no mystery. This is no secret that's supposed to be kept for a, a select group of people. So Paul's pushing back here and he says, and it's something that you've understood. It's understandable for all. We see here in Colossians 1, 15 and 16, Paul says this. He says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Remember, that firstborn was probably a hook for the time period, for the culture. One, it would have hooked 
them into understanding, oh, Jesus gets the privilege and status of the firstborn, being the Son of God. And for the Gnostic-type thinker, he would have been, what does this mean, this Jesus is firstborn? And as they would have listened to more of the Christian teaching, they would have understood, oh, that's Paul saying that Jesus has this privileged status as being the Son of God, not that he was actually birthed or created. Verse 16, for in him all things were created. So who created all things? Jesus. So obviously if Jesus created all things, then the physical world isn't bad. It wasn't some bad spirit like the Gnostic thinking group was saying created the physical world. No, Jesus did. Things in heaven and on earth. So the spiritual and the physical, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. God wanted this physical world to come to fruition. That is pushing back on Gnostic thinking. Check out uh, the next set of verses. Chapter 1 still, Paul says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness, the whole fullness of God dwelling in Jesus. That's pushing back again on the physical being bad. Jesus has, basically we're saying here, Jesus has God completely in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood. Peace is made through the physical blood of Jesus. Shed on the cross, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. To present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. You can see how Paul is very powerfully pushing back on this Gnostic type thinking that's pushing its way into the church. Paul's pushing back, baby. So there is one of the reasons why Paul wrote this letter. The second major reason Paul wrote this letter was to spur on Christians to just stick to the essentials of the faith, right? And to Jesus. You've heard me say that at least once, right? We've, I've said it often. Paul wanted Christians to just stick to Jesus and to the essentials of the faith. For Jesus is far superior to anyone or anything or any wisdom or knowledge or special teaching that's out there. Paul's saying it's Jesus. And this sticking to the faith, you can see, and this sticking to Jesus is building off of the first. If Paul's saying, hey, don't go getting sidetracked on what the Gnostic thinker is teaching or saying to you, you stay committed to the essentials of the faith and to Jesus. And of course, this sticking to, this faith, to the faith and to Jesus is how the Christian grows. In fact, over the past two Sundays, I've talked at length that the Christian who is growing is a Christian who is maturing. Right? That we must listen, value, and apply the word of God in our lives in order to grow and mature. Simply put, a second major reason Paul wrote Colossians was to help Christians mature. Check out Colossians. Uh, again, we're in chapter 1, verses 9 through, looks like, 10. For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, speaking of God's Spirit, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. You can clearly see how this is emphasize, emphasizing growth, right? Paul is emphasizing growth here. And we see here he mentions that fruit. We've talked a lot about fruit in this study. And it's just this expressive, vivid way of describing how the words and actions of our lives either represent God well or not so well, right? The words and actions of our lives either represent God well or not so well. It's really the evidence of our maturity in a particular area of our lives, right? Think about that. In some areas of our lives, we might be very mature, but in other areas of our lives, we might be lacking some maturity. 
What do you mean, Dan? Well, we looked at last week, we looked at how Paul says you need to put on gentleness, patience, humility, kindness, compassion. Those are areas where maybe in some ways I'm mature, I'm getting that, I'm doing well. In other areas, maybe I'm not there yet. And God is saying, I want you to grow and mature in all these ways in the Lord. But the encouraging truth that the Bible teaches is we don't do that alone, do we? In fact, just last Sunday, we looked at Jesus' teaching in John's gospel, John 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you're the branches. We stay connected to Jesus, we abide in him, and we bear fruit, right? So we do not bear this fruit, or we don't bear this burden, if you will, of bearing fruit alone. We don't do that. In fact, I think that's what Paul was building off of here in these verses. This is still chapter 1, verse 27. Paul says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one who we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Did you just hear what Paul wrote? What did Paul say? Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that they so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Couple thoughts here. First. Your Bible might not say mature. Your Bible might say complete. Your Bible might say perfect. So that you may be presented perfect or complete. The idea is what? A need for maturity. I like how the NRSV does render that word mature. So that you are mature in Christ. The NIV does the same. All right. The idea, right, so I don't belabor this too much, is that a mature Christian is a fruitful Christian. In fact, Paul begins this letter by talking about us bearing fruit. This is chapter 1. Paul says we need to mature. Earlier we've seen in chapter 1 we need to bear fruit. Paul ends this letter, we're going to see today, chapter 4, with talking about maturity. A mature Christian is a fruitful Christian. I don't know, but I've been thinking about this, and I've been saying this probably every service, but I'm going to say it again. We've all bitten into a piece of fruit that's reached its peak of ripeness, haven't we? We've all bitten into a piece of fruit that is so sweet and juicy and ripe, and it leaves us wanting more. And that is exactly the concept here that the Bible has in mind. You and I bear fruit and it should be mature. It should taste good. In other words, people should experience our words and actions, and they should leave them wanting to be around us more. And ultimately, what they are tasting and seeing is that the Lord is good, and he is at work in your life. That's the idea. Now, understandably, verse 29 Paul is talking about, to this end, I strenuously contend. I think he's talking about what he's saying in verse 28. That I want everyone to know about Jesus. That I want them to know about this wisdom and to present everyone mature. I think that's exactly what Paul means in verse 29. That's what he's strenuously working for. But indirectly, I think there is a principle here that's built off of what we're talking about. We don't bear fruit without God's help, but we need to cooperate with God as we grow in maturity. We need to strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in us to grow in the faith. All right. Remember last week's challenge too? Does anybody remember last week's challenge? So last week I challenged us all. Amber and I sat down last night. We talked about this. We're praying about a couple in particular in the challenge. Chapter 3 of Colossians, verses 5 through 15, contain some do's and don'ts for the Christian life. And I challenge us all to pick one or two where we're asking God, where do I need to grow this year in 2021? What do I need to say no to? 
what should I not be doing? And is there one on the list of what I should be doing? How can I grow? All right, so the recap is finished. That's where we've been in Colossians. We're looking now to complete the letter. And let me tell you now where we're headed. We're going to walk through Colossians 3.18 all the way to 4.18, which is the end of the letter. And the focus today is this. A sign of Christian maturity is thankfulness. And thankfulness helps us to effectively obey God and the hard commands that God gives us sometimes, we find we really need thankfulness. I'm going to say this again. A sign of Christian maturity is thankfulness. And thankfulness helps us to effectively obey God, especially when we come across those hard commands that he's given us. Remember last week I had mentioned here, this is where we kind of ended our study last week. Um, Verse 15 of chapter 3, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. And then it goes on to say, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, Verse 17, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, doing what? Giving thanks to God the Father through him. I think most of us are aware that thankfulness has a significant positive effect on our lives. Numerous studies show the correlation of how being thankful makes us happier healthier humans. In 2011, an article by the Harvard Medical School came out just before Thanksgiving, perfect timing, to discuss how giving thanks increases happiness. And I'm going to read to you an excerpt from the article. Here you go. Gratitude is a thankful appreciation for what an individual receives whether tangible or intangible, whether gra- or with gratitude, rather, people acknowledge the goodness in their lives. In the process of doing this, right, people usually recognize that the source of that goodness lies at least partially outside of themselves. As a result, gratitude also helps people connect to something larger than themselves as individuals, whether to other people, nature, or a higher power. 2011, Harvard Medical School, talking about gratitude. Remember, Paul wrote this letter to the churches in Colossians to help them mature in Christ, to stick to the essentials of the faith and to Jesus. And one of the essentials of the Christian faith is to be thankful. In particular, to be thankful to God for what he's done and continues to do in our lives. A mature Christian then recognizes that the source of goodness that he or she is grateful for lies squarely in God himself. Gratitude for God certainly then connects us to something larger than ourselves, doesn't it? There's no doubt. You don't get any bigger than that. Right? And certainly, gratitude comes from Our gratitude comes from God extending grace and salvation to us, making a way for us to be forgiven, to be reconnected to God, to have a relationship with him, to be be able to become new sons and daughters of the Most High, right? But this is a gratitude that extends beyond salvation. We are thankful for God because he saved us, but we're also thankful for God because he continues to work in our lives. As Paul has said in this letter and other scriptures throughout the the Bible and the New Testament in particular, of course, with what we're talking about, teaches that we are thankful for that God gave us his Holy Spirit, is helping us be more selfless, Christ-like people, to be able to, in short, be fruitful, right? To have Words and actions in our lives that are good. 
Now, all this talk about gratitude reminds me of the riveting and, in my opinion, Oscar-robbed film, A Christmas Carol, but it's The Muppets Christmas Carol. All right? Now, we're coming off the holidays, and so... This one was one we just recently watched. Robbed, I'm telling you. Oscar robbed. Riveting film. The Muppets Christmas Carol. The Muppets Christmas Carol, of course, is based off of Charles Dickens' novel, A Christmas Carol. In the story, Ebenezer Scrooge is given the opportunity to change his life when three spirits visit him in the early hours of Christmas morning. And through a dramatic look... Into his past, present, and future, Scrooge's eyes are open to just the cold-hearted, callous man that he really is. But God gave him a second chance, and he wakes up that Christmas morning a changed man. Now, one of the closing lines of the song that's at the end of the movie goes like this. And yes, every night will end, and every day will start with a grateful prayer and a thankful heart. I mean, think about that. That's yeah, Muppets Christmas, right? Michael Caine, cheesing it up. But think about what he's saying. Think about that song. That's that one line. Do we do that? And yes, every night will end, and every day will start with a grateful prayer and a thankful heart. Charles Dickens wrote, reflect upon your present blessings. Get it up here for you. Reflect upon your present blessings, of which every man has plenty, not on your past misfortunes, of which all men have some. We do not get a thankful, grateful heart on our own, like just sitting there waiting for it to become grateful. We must work at it. Just like what we were talking about last week, we must be intentional in our maturity as Christians. We must choose, what am I going to reflect on? Where am I going to put my focus today? Am I going to start each day and end each day with a grateful prayer and a thankful heart? You know, gratitude protects us from bitterness, and it reminds us to keep a keen eye on both our blessings and really on the one who gives the blessings, right? Gratitude helps us with that. It keeps us from becoming bitter, and I'm going to say it again, it helps us to focus on our blessings as well as on the one who gives the blessings. But also, gratitude helps us to have the right mindset as we obey God's commands. So when we think about this, I'm going to read this to you guys again. Colossians 3.15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful goes on to say, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, I want to stress that right now because we're getting ready to go into Colossians 3.18. Paul's going to give some very specific things in regards to how we conduct ourselves within the family and issues when it comes to slaves. And Paul is saying right before this, and whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father. Thanks to God, thanks to God the Father through him. All right. However, you might be thinking, well, Dan, you keep coming back to this. Is this something that just now Paul's addressing in Colossians? Well, no. Paul's been talking about being thankful since the beginning of the letter. Colossians, this is chapter 1, verse 3. We always thank God. We always thank God. We always thank God. Paul goes on to say in Colossians, 
being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of his light. Paul goes on, chapter 2. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and what? Overflowing with thankfulness. No, this has been subtly in the letter the whole time. Paul said, you need to be thankful. You need to be thankful. You need to be thankful. We cannot separate thankfulness from a maturing Christian. You cannot do that. If you are a maturing Christian, you are a thankful Christian. You are thankful for God for what he's done. He's done a tremendous for us, and he continues to do a tremendous amount for us. And we must have that attitude towards God. All right, you guys ready? Colossians 3.18, we're diving in here. All right. Wives, submit to yourselves, to your husbands, as is fitting to the Lord. These are not the most popular verses today. Um, many see these words actually steeped in a patriarchal view of society of family life, and this view should no longer be propagated. What is Dan going to say? You guys are wondering, aren't you? What's he going to say about this? However, like much of the Bible, there is more to this than meets the eye. In fact, these same topics are addressed in Paul's letter to Ephesians. In fact, I just clicked on it accidentally a moment ago. Paul says essentially the same thing, but he gives us a little more detail in the letter of Ephesians. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. So wives submit only to, so the wife submits to her husband only. That's one. As you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. However, Colossians rounds this out a little bit. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. The wife submits to her own husband as is fitting to the Lord, meaning she is never to submit to him if what he's asking her to do is sinful or if he's verbally or physically abusive. Right? I think that's a given, but sometimes that has been in the past not a given in culture. But that's certainly a given. For this reason, this teaching alone, this right here, wives submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. That little section as fitting to the Lord would have been countercultural to that time period. Christianity was teaching that men, you don't control your wife, you don't own your wife. Rather, you lead her in ways that please God. And we're going to talk more in a moment about how husbands are to lead. So what is this submission? You see, this submission is about the wife being faithful to God and God's commands. Let me go back here. Wives, submit to yourselves, to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. Ultimately, the wife is submitting to her husband because she is actually, first and foremost, submitting herself to the Lord. In other words, like I said, a wife submits to her husband because God has given the husband the role of leader in the home. We're going to talk about that role here in a moment. Stick with me. So this really isn't about women submitting to men. But this has been taken out of context, and it has just continued to make it seem like, oh, the Bible teaches this patriarchal society, that this should just continue to promote a patriarchal kind of way of thinking. No, there are and should be great women leaders outside the home. Furthermore, the woman doesn't submit to her husband because he knows everything. Contrary to popular belief. That's not why she's submitting. Again, the submission has to do with the maturing wife being thankful to God and for the role he has assigned her husband. 
Let me say something else about submission. Submission doesn't mean the wife is silent, that she doesn't weigh in on decisions. This doesn't mean that she doesn't give her opinion on things. This doesn't mean submission doesn't mean she's gutless, that she's unable to conduct her own business affairs. All one has to do is read Proverbs 31 to remind themselves that the godly wife is wise, is physically, emotionally, spiritually strong. She conducts her own business deals with her own money that she's earned. She continues to make an income on her own and continues to take care of her family and bless her husband. There is no way when you read Proverbs 31 that you get this submissive, this sort of cowardly, gutless woman at all. No, the mature wife recognizes that ultimately God is the one she submits to. And if God says her husband is the leader in the home, then she should honor that word from God with gratitude and encourage him to lead. But now that I've said that, what kind of leader is the husband to be? Because oftentimes we have, and I have heard this in my own day, 21st century, I have heard women submit, women, the wife, submit, but not the husband. And we're going to see here, there is mutual submission. And that is not often taught, but it's very clear in Scripture. So what kind of leader is the husband to be? What kind of leader is the wife supposed to encourage her husband to be? Let's check it out. Colossians. This one here, if we just went on Colossians alone, this isn't all that much. And it wouldn't have been all that countercultural. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. All right, all right. What's next? But that's not the only thing the Word of God has to say about husbands. Let's go to Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives. How are we to love our wives? Oh, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I love how Ephesians rounds out this teaching. Let me ask this question, and I'll make this statement right now. That would have been tremendously countercultural. As you break this down, this would have been absolutely countercultural in the first century, and it still remains to be today. How did Jesus love the church? With a passionate love, didn't he? I mean, God knows only just how much he and his son loves the church. Jesus has a passionate love for the church. I mean, for goodness sake, what do we call the week leading up to Easter? Passion week. I mean, Jesus loved the church and loves the church with a passionate love. Question, husbands, do we display that kind of commitment, that passion to our wives? How else did Jesus love? Gave himself up for her. So the love that husbands are to display is a sacrificial love. So the love that husbands are to display, I'm going to say again, is a sacrificial love. So Jesus loved sacrificially. Jesus sacrificed, are you listening here? Jesus sacrificed his interests for the sake of our interests. How is the husband to love his wife? Like Jesus. How did Jesus love? He sacrificed his interests for the sake of his wife's interests. Does that sound like a dominarian, patriarchal, sort of bigotry kind of man? I'm sacrificing my interests for your interests. Your concerns are going ahead of my concerns. That's the type of love that Jesus is telling husbands to love. That's the model. There is mutual submission going on here. But if we just focus on the first part, we think, ah, that's out of date. That doesn't have any relevance today. It certainly does. It certainly does. In fact, I was doing a Bible study. This was a number of years ago, but I was in my 20s, and I was doing a college Bible study. And it just so happens there was this one gal. She came in frequently. And we just so happened to be going through these verses that night, and she was she was on the feminine side, the feminist side of things, 
And I thought, oh no, this is going to be interesting. And when we got done walking through this, I will never forget, she looked at me and she said, I would absolutely love a man that loved me like that. We cannot ignore God's word. If we start saying, well, that's not relevant today, then we are missing what really God has for us. Let me continue this because God isn't done with the men yet. God is not done with the husbands yet. So let me ask this question, husbands. Are we sacrificing for our wives? Are we putting their interests ahead of our own? Now, this doesn't mean that the husband becomes a doormat or never fulfills certain dreams. Jesus was certainly not a doormat. No one ever described Jesus as being a doormat. And no doubt, Jesus' main objectives were always accomplished. But Jesus' love and sacrifice for the church, like I said, serves as our model for the type of leader we're to be in the home. You see, Jesus is the exemplary model for servant leadership. We've heard that often. What does a servant leader look like? I mean, there's a full doctoral program at a Catholic university called Gonzaga in Washington State. That's, and one of its focuses within this leadership program is servant leadership. It focuses on the life and work and teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the exemplary model of servant leadership. So how is the husband to lead? He is to lead like a servant. What does that mean? Again, think of Jesus. You don't get this gutless, weak man. But you get someone who Jesus told his disciples, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's the model for the husband. You see how our society, our culture, that whatever kind of um, culture that where people are practicing Christianity, how it influences the teaching. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. God's word is supposed to influence the culture. But we shouldn't be surprised by that. The culture has so often always influenced the church, hasn't it? The culture has so often always influenced the church. But God in his teaching is saying, go and influence the culture. And it starts in your families. And husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. I'm not done with the husbands yet. Jesus was also the exemplary model of the one who is faithful to God. Jesus is the exemplary model of the one who is faithful to God. So the role of the leader in the home that God has given husbands and dads is to not be this male domineering authorities all mine, but in reality here is how God wants husbands and dads to lead. Like I've said, I'm going to sum it up here with a passionate love for God, for our spouse if there's children involved, a passionate love for children and also a passionate love for our neighbor. Husbands, God wants us to work hard to ensure our wife and our family have their needs met. God wants us to work hard at sacrificing our interests for their interests, for the interests of our spouse primarily. And of course, our children. God wants us to be the one that set the example in the home of what it looks like to serve others and to be faithful to God. Now, husbands, this is all easier said than done, right? That's really a tall order if you think about it. But the maturing husband understands the best way he's going to lead is by being willing to follow Jesus, by being willing to be led. John 15, abide in me. Stay connected to me and you will bear fruit. The husband must stay connected to Jesus to be this type of leader in the home. A servant leader, one who loves passionately and sacrificially. One who lays down his interests for the interests of his spouse. That's the type of leader. You can see the mutual submission that Christianity is teaching. Again, yes, who is the leader of the home? The husband is, but how is he to lead? Like Christ. You can see why that woman, who, like I said, this young woman was very much opposed to not only Christianity, but she was coming because of a friend. 
and I think there in deep inside her heart, she was curious. But you could see how when this gets explained, a woman would say, even one who's like, I'm kind of mad at men would like this. Now, the way I see it, either party cannot sincerely apply these verses to their lives without having an attitude of gratitude. Who's been waiting for me to say that? Come on now. At some point, you knew the cheese was going to come out. The attitude of gratitude. But it's true, right? And the only way we're going to apply these verses to our lives, husbands and wives, is if we have this attitude of gratitude. And it starts with first and foremost being thankful to God for what he's done in our lives. And then from there, the roles that he's given each of us. Colossians 3.20. We'll jump into this right now. Colossians 3.20 this is the next couple verses. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Ephesians, Paul talks about this as well. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up with the training and instruction of the Lord. This is so important. This is so important because children ultimately learn to relate to God as their heavenly father and trust his authority by first being under their parents' authority. This is how it works. Children learn to relate to their heavenly father and be under his authority as they learn to trust their parents and be under their authority. Now, I think verse 21, if we go back to Colossians here, which I like how Colossians kind of rounds out. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Rather, I should say Ephesians rounds it out. Uh, Ephesians says, if I can tap on it here. Ephesians says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, just like where we talked about the wife. In the Lord. Children are never to obey their parents in a way that God would say, that's wrong. That's not, that's not good. What, what the parent is asking the child to do is, is, is not appropriate, is not godly. Those are things where Paul is saying, it's rounded out here in Ephesians, children, obey your parents in the Lord. So what Paul has in mind in Colossians is that same idea. He's saying, in everything that your parents are telling you to do that pleases God. That's what Paul has in mind. Now, one of the reasons verse 21 is in there, we've talked about I touched on already that the idea that the dad takes the lead in setting the example of what it looks like to be faithful to God. This would include taking the lead in ensuring spiritual formation happens in the home. But hear me out here, because I think as soon as we hear that, we picture dad's the one with the Bible, dad's the one with the spiritual lessons, dad's the one talking. That may not be the case. Mom may, better, may be the better teacher. Mom may be the better one to explain the lesson. What I'm saying is the dad's taking the lead to make sure it happens. See, the moment we think lead, we think, oh, so everyone's stopping and listening to the man. Everyone's stopping and listening to dad. No, dad's just making sure that spiritual formation happens. This is a mutual effort by mom and dad. So when we think that, we can't just hear that and immediately put that sort of thought in mind. That's just about the dad and everyone's listening to the dad. No. The dad is making sure that spiritual formation is happening, and it may very well be that mom's doing the teaching, but he's making sure that the lessons are happening. And to continue with that, this is important. Dad then must not in any way undermine the teaching, right? But be fully engaged. So if mom's doing the teaching, he needs to not be uh, you know, off, you know, on his phone or whatever, he needs to be engaged and actively participating in that teaching, in that discussion. It is so critical that children and grandchildren see dads, grandfathers pray and talk about God and their faith regularly. If you look around this room, there is way more women than men 
women have a tendency to gravitate more towards the church, certainly in our time period. And there's something to be said about when the men also step up and say, I'm going to pray. Two, I'm going to talk about God and what he's done in my life. It is very impactful on the next generation, isn't it? When they see both parties involved. And so I think partly verse 21 is about, hey, fathers, you need to be involved. And as he had mentioned earlier, as a leader in the home, this is how you are to lead to ensure that spiritual formation is happening and that you are participating. Let me just end this thought with this first point. Dads, whether we realize it or not, our actions tell our children a lot about what we really think about Jesus, and in turn, it will tell them what they should think about Jesus. There's no doubt. Our actions tell our children and our grandchildren what they should think about Jesus, right? The second reason why Paul wrote this, I think, is because in general, dads need to be more conscious of their words and their tone towards their children. I said, in general, there are exceptions, but men tend to be more hard on their kids. And I think Paul is saying here, listen, don't embitter your children. They're going to become discouraged. Don't be too hard on them. Like I said, Ephesians uh, 6 uh, we see here, Paul says, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, as soon as I say that, you guys are thinking, but wait a minute. Or maybe some of you are thinking, but if we're too soft on the children, they're going to become unruly and disrespectful. The Bible definitely says parents are to discipline their children. So it isn't about Paul saying, lessen up on the discipline or lighten up on the discipline rather Paul is saying it's probably how dads you're approaching the discipline I think that's more of it it's not to lighten up on the discipline but how are you approaching the discipline I know this is hard to imagine but as parents with five younger children there's a fair amount of correcting going on in our home Hard to imagine. And on more than one occasion, Amber has reminded me how gentleness is a very powerful tool when it comes to how a child responds to correction. Right? It's not about lessening the discipline or the amount of time you discipline or oh, I'll let that one slide. No, it's how we approach the discipline. Gentleness also, I think when we say that, it makes people think, well, that's kind of, you know, a little, I don't know, um, namby-pamby. Ah, I've been gentle. That's not gentleness. It's not about being namby-pamby. It's learning that one can be firm and gentle at the same time. That's what it's about. In addition, and specific to our study this morning, we... Amber and I both do our best to remind each other, to remind the children just how thankful we are for them. Remember Charles Dickens. Dickens said, we need to reflect on our present blessings, and we need to remind our children that they are blessings. And I am almost 40 years old, and my mom still reminds me and my sister of how thankful, and my dad does too, but my mom does more, uh, and that's okay. That's just what a mom is, you know, and she, that's how she does it. She reminds me and my sister how thankful she is that she's our mom, that we're a blessing to her. And I know my dad's thankful for me too, but I think that's partly why Paul put that in there. Dads, remind your children of that. Don't be too hard on them as they grow and seek to also, and as you help to seek, uh, to help them rather to mature in the Lord, right? All right, this next section, I'm only going to spend a little bit of time because we're going to actually touch on this next week. So you see here, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it 
not only when their eye is on you and to carry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong, anyone who does wrong, will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. And the very next verse is this. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Did you catch that connection? Let me read it to you right here. Anyone, this is chapter 3, verse 25. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. Anyone. He's not saying slaves. He's not saying slaves. He's saying anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. In the very next verse, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. There is much to be said about this, but we're going to talk about this next week, but we're not going to be in Colossians. I'm going to tell you in a moment how we're doing this. But my point in this is there's, again, always more than what meets the eye. Remember back in here, Colossians, Verse 11 in particular. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. What did he just say? Remember we talked about this last week. Jesus totally levels the playing field. God is at work changing the hearts and minds of people and how they approach this terrible idea of slavery. And he's doing it through Jesus. So there's more than what meets the eye. And we're going to touch on this, not touch on this, we're going to totally, fully address it next week because there's lots to be said on this subject. So I'm just going to finish with just a story and a few closing thoughts. All right. Let's go here. Colossians 4. Devote yourselves to prayer. This is the end of the chapter. He's beginning it um, and the end of the letter, I should say, end of the letter and kind of closing to the end of the chapter. We're in chapter 4. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and what? Thankful. From beginning to end in this letter, Paul is telling Christians, be thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should, Paul says. And then he says, be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. Now, just my story, I'm going to take you back to the preceding verses here. Um, right here. Chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And then we just read how we're supposed to make the most of our time. He says here, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So here's my story. As you all know, I'm in HR, and I had a coworker come to me one day. He had some issues going on, and he looked at me, and he said, Dan, honestly, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you deal with all of our issues, all of our problems, the whining, coming to us, you know, coming to you with things. He says, I don't know how you stay happy in your job. I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know how you come to work each day and stay so positive. You know, I could have just taken the compliment, and initially I did. I said, I appreciate that. And the guy went on his way. And later I felt convicted. And I thought, you know what, I should have been a little more forthright. It's not like there isn't a single person in my workplace that doesn't know that I'm a Christian. They do, and many of them know I'm a pastor. Um, now, but this was prior to me being a pastor, but it was just in the last several months. So anyway, that afternoon, I took a little piece of paper that was pinned to the cork board in my office in a very inconspicuous spot. And the paper was these two verses. So in my office is Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, 
Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. I told him, I said, man, honestly, these are some verses that guide my life. I said, so at the end of the day, I feel like I'm not working for my boss. I'm not trying to walk around and please everyone here. I said, I want to do my best. But ultimately, I'm working hard to do my job well to please God. And then I handed him this little piece of paper. I said, if you want this, you can have it. And he was like, thanks. That, to me, is a very natural way of applying what I just read to you in Colossians 4. Right here. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. That was just a natural way of applying those verses because I said, you know what, ultimately, God does get the credit for how I stay positive and for um, the work that I do. And I think those are just beautiful reminders in our lives that God is at work in us and through us even when, and people are watching that work that God's doing in us and through us, that fruit that we're bringing to maturity when we're not even aware of it. All right, well, so you're thinking, how are we going to address this all next week but not be in Colossians? You ready for the sneak peek? You ready? Come on now. Who's excited about this? What is this at the end of Colossians? There's this random dude mentioned. He's coming with this other guy named Tychicus. He's coming with Onesimus or Onesimus. Our faithful and dear brother who is one of you, they will tell you everything that is happening here. Onesimus is the slave of Philemon. We're going to go through the letter of Philemon and we're going to see how Paul addressed slavery and how he addressed how Philemon should treat Onesimus. And notice here Paul mentions Onesimus here coming to these Christians in Colossae, and he says, oh, by the way, him and Tychicus, they're going to tell you everything that's been going on. Very cool. So we'll dive into this concept of how God addressed slavery next week in the letter of Philemon. It's only one chapter. I really encourage you to read it ahead of time. All right. If you would, let's pray. We'll close our, our time here live streaming together. All right. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time Lord, thank you for your word, a lot in it. I understand there's just a lot being said here in your word. God, I pray you'd help us to continue to understand it. Lord, you are the one we need to be dependent on. Not any pastor, not any teacher. God, help your Holy Spirit work in each of our lives. You know the questions we have. Lord, I guess my prayer is this. Help us to respond accordingly to what it is you wanting to teach us and to what you're wanting to do in our lives. I thank you for today. God, a special blessing, I pray, for everyone, those here in church, those online. I pray you be with them. Go with us, God, today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All good, Randy? Okay. All right, so now it's just us.